Welcome to this morning session. For me, it's a pleasure and an honor also to introduce Jacqueline Mesquita, who I, I make my, my research as a chairman and noticed that uh, Jacqueline won a prize, an important prize of L'Oreal UNESCO Prize for Women in Science. So congratulations for the prize and we look forward to your talk. So please, uh, Jacqueline, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm so sorry for this uh, technical problems in the beginning. Um, but thank you, uh, Julio, for the introduction. And good morning for everybody. Thanks for coming for the talk. And uh, today I talk about uh, neutral functional differential equations with state dependent delays. And uh, my idea is to give uh, an overview and talk about recent results. Also, I'd like to thank very much for the organizers for the invitation, uh, João Vitor and Leandro. It's a great pleasure to me to be here and to talk in that uh, very important conference. And uh, it's a little strange not to see the audience uh, when we are presenting, but uh, I'm very glad to see many known names here. Also, I'd like to congratulate the organizers for the gender balance that uh, Juliana also mentioned yesterday. It's very nice to participate on a conference uh, like that when you have this uh, gender balance. So thank you very much. So today, as I talked before, I'd like to talk about neutral functional differential equations with stated dependent delays. So my idea is to give you an overview of these equations and talk about some recent results. So this work uh, was supported by Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and CAPES. And the outline of my talk, I will start with some uh, preliminaries and motivation. Then I will talk about the linearized instability principle for neutral uh, functional differential equations with state dependent delays. Then I will talk about a class of major neutral functional differential equations. And finally, I will talk about some open and developing problems. So I had some technical, technical problems. I would uh, share some screen, but I will try to do everything with this screen. So probably I will talk more and uh, will not be able to, to write like I, I was planning in the beginning. So uh, for the preliminaries, um, I would like uh, to mention that since I would like to deal with uh, functional differential equations, since I, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with this type of equation, so I'd like to explain a little how it looks like. So a functional differential equation is a type of equation that you have in your right-hand side such a type of delay. So usually you denote this uh, part in your uh, right-hand side with this x of t, that's a function that uh, you evaluate in certain theta, and this theta is in a certain interval. And then uh, this function is what we call it like a delay function, like the memory. And we can have many types of uh, delay functions, so uh, delay differential equations. We can have that this delay is constant, you can have that this delay can change in a certain interval. Also, we can have that this delay change with the time. Also, this delay can change, change with the uh, state. So we can have many different kinds of delays. So that's what we have for the names of the, the, the equations, like functional differential equations with constant delays or time independent, uh, functional differential equations, also functional differential equations with uh, state-dependent delay. So depending how you have that in your equation. So and uh, for the neutral, the difference that we have from the functional differential equations, it's uh, concerning about the derivative in the part that you have the delay. If the, the part that you have this delay term, this memory term, you have that this is a neutral functional differential equation. So you have all these types of uh, uh, equations when you deal with that. And uh, since I know that many people here work with PDEs, it's also possible to include in the partial differential equations the delay term. So 
it's possible to also considering these effects of the delay in your equation. And about motivation, these types of equations uh, are very important for model many, many phenomena. For instance, uh, if you have some phenomena that say you have uh, a time in between cause and effect, you can model that better using functional differential equations. So for instance, uh, now we are, we are dealing with uh, this, all the situations with uh, coronavirus, epidemi epidemiology, also these this types of equations, they are very important to model this type of phenomena because we know that when a person had uh, coronavirus, the symptoms do not appear like instantaneously, but there is a certain time in between the person take the disease, be like uh, infected and uh, the symptoms appear. Also, you can use these types of equations for population models, also to study like cancer models and uh, many others because you have this time between cause and effect. And just to say that it's very hard to deal with this type of equations. First, because uh, you change all the structure because now you are dealing with uh, uh, space functions which, has, which are much more complicated than when you're with uh, ODE that you usually are in a space that's not, that can be like finite dimensional space. So here we have all these problems. And also, it's not so easy to predict the behavior of the solution. So here I give one example just to show how the delay can affect the behavior of the solution. So here you have very simple logistic equation that you can see here. And here we have the Hudson equation. And the only difference between this logistic equation and the Hudson equation, if you see, is this term, that's the delay term here. And, but this, that's the delay term, it changes a lot the behavior of the solution. So if you plot both, you see that this is the behavior of the logistic equation, the solution, and here is the solution of the Hudson equation. So this small term that you put here, it can affect all the structure of your solution. So you can have completely different behavior for the solutions. So that's why sometimes it's very hard to deal with uh, delay differential equations because if you put a very small delay, because here if you see it's like a constant delay, so if you put only that, it will change very much your solution. So sometimes it's very hard to predict what will happen with your solution. So, okay. So uh, I will talk, uh, the first part of my talk, I will talk about some recent results and I'll talk about the linearized instability principle for neutral functional differential equations with state-dependent delays. So my co-author for this work is Professor uh, Bernhard Lannweida from Justus Liebig University in Gießen, Germany. And uh, the timeline of uh, this research is about one model that uh, this model started to be studied by Brunowski, Erdeli, and Hans Otto Walter. They investigated this model that is uh, like a currency exchange model. And uh, they um, proved some results and made some conjectures about this model. And then later, Hans Otto Walter uh, deeper, uh, and, uh, studied deeper this uh, equation and prove some results about, about bifurcation of periodic solutions with large periods. So he proved on this in two papers. Then later we have the results from Garabi, Kovac, and Fisting, and they prove a global asymptotic stability of the trivial solution for that equation when we have that A belongs to this interval here. So that was conjectured in the first paper and they proved this. So then later we have the work from Stamp and Stamp, who, uh, he was the first one to improve the model, but in the delay term here, state dependent delay. So if you see the delay now depends on the state of uh, the solution. So we have that here, the state dependent delay. So he was the first one to improve the model but in this term here. So then later, uh, Hans Otto Walter, he improved 
the model and I put here this neutral term. Uh, so here we have neutral because here you have the derivative in the part that you have the delay and here the delay depends on the state. So he also improved this with this uh, equation for the module. And then he investigated many properties concerning the solution like existence and uniqueness, continuous dependence on parameters, differentiability of solutions, and the linearized instability. However, um, the linearized instability, he, he didn't make, make the, the proof because there, there, was, there were some problems when you deal with, uh, with this part about the linearized instability uh, because of the spectrum, when you deal with uh, neutral equations, it's very complicated because you can have uh, infinite eigenvalues in your spectrum. So because of that, it, it's some hard to, to deal with uh, this uh, type of equations uh, and to prove this type of linearized instability. So it, uh, this problem was open and then we decided to investigate that. So we proved the linearized instability for these types of equations. So I will talk about the techniques in order to prove that uh, linearized instability principle. So here, again, the problem that I told before for the current exchange that uh, uh, Professor Hans Otto Walter formulated in the neutral part with neutral term here. And uh, we first, in order to start, we would like to rewrite that equation in that abstract form. So we would like to rewrite that using this. And also we'd like that our G satisfies certain conditions that I will explain later. So we would like that this form here. Then in order to do that, we need to introduce some uh, evaluation map. So here we have this evaluation map that goes from this uh, set. So we have this pair here, and this, uh, it will be like, you take the function applied in T, so that's the evaluation map, and here is the, in the restriction of the evaluation map, so you have that. And then using this evaluation map, is that possible to define G like this composition, where we have this one, these two are the proje projections, this is in the second factor and here in the first factor. And then here writing like that, we have that we, we can translate this, uh, we can here write this equation in that abstract form. And more than that, we know that if you define G like that, in our model specifically, we have that uh, G satisfies the conditions that we want. So we wanted that G satisfies certain conditions that I will explain. And in order to do that, uh, if you define our G like this, in the, our model specifically, we have that G will satisfy these uh, conditions. So uh, here is our equation again. And uh, only to rec recall, we have that uh, continuous differentiable function is called a solution of our problem if x satisfies three, this uh, equation, and also if we have this pair belongs to omega or to w, where w is, is a subset, open subset of this set here. So here we have our condition. So the first condition is about continuity. So we ask that g is continuous. And the second one is very important because uh, we would like to ensure uh, in a certain way that the neutral term, never, we never will consider that uh, the, the delay in the neutral terms is zero because otherwise we will lose the neutral part because if you come back here, this is the neutral part of our equation because you have the derivative in the part that you have the delay. So we have, the, here, uh, exactly the neutral part. So we don't want that the delay in that part is zero, because if it's zero, you are not more in a neutral equation. So uh, we have here, uh, we ask that the delay in the neutral term never, never vanish. So in order to do that, the condition that we ask is that if you have two functions that are equal in certain interval, that's uh, far from zero, you have that the G is, 
equal, uh, G applied in that functions are equal. So you have that uh, condition. And then we have, of course, some uh, local estimates that, uh, that uh, uh, allow us to prove like existence, uniqueness, and so on, to ensure also that uh, properties. And uh, also we have this uh, linear extension of the derivative of G. So you have uh, that uh, the derivative of G has this linear extension given by this. And this is very important in order to prove that this set that we have here, that are these functions which satisfies this equation, is a submanifold of Banach space. So using that the properties of the linear extension, we can prove that, which is very important in this, set, in this issue. So here, another is local estimate that we have now concerning the derivative. And here we have about some upper semi-continuity and then here again, other estimates. I'll not to go deeper in that because it's, it's too technical. So uh, here we have these uh, closed subsets of the manifold because if you look at the manifold, uh, we have that is a manifold as we talked before. It's possible to prove using the linear extension of the derivative, but we do not have that this manifold is invariant. That's why we need to define this closed subset. So we have this closed subset of the manifolds, and now this one is invariant. So Hans Otto Walter proved that if you start here, so you have that your solution is twice continuous differentiable, and you continue in that set. So you have the invariance of this set. So that's uh, very important here. So uh, in order, okay, to prove our linearized instability principle. So just to remember, when we would like to prove this type of uh, instability, we need we have like our original equation, and then we would like to linearize our equation in an equilibrium point, and we would like to to ensure that the solution of both equations are close to each other. So in order to be able to prove the linearized instability or instability principle. But here, in order to have that, we need that our G satisfies these, all these conditions that we talked before, this G0, G1, G2, G3, also G4, and G6, and G7. So when we have all of these, we can ensure that both solutions are close from each other, and also in this set, in this specific set, we have uh, this approach concerning the original solution and the solution of the linearized equation. So, and in order to prove uh, that uh, our, uh, the trivial solution is unstable, we will use here the invariance of the coin. So we need to add some assumptions. So the first assumption is concerning about the semi-group, the operator. So we have that is a C0 semi-group. And as I talked before, when we deal with neutral, we do not, uh, we can't ensure that the eigenvalues are finite in a spectrum. It's not possible to ensure these for all neutral equations. So if you take a very simple equation, a uh, neutral equation, and uh, if you do the calculations for the characteristic equation, it's possible to show that in a very simple case, you have infinity eigenvalues for your spectrum. So the biggest problem here is because when you have that, it's very hard to have a lower estimate for your same group. And uh, we need, in order to prove the uh, linearized instability principle, to have this low, lower uh, estimate for our semigroup. So that's why here we need to ask this condition in order to ensure that it will be satisfied, that you can decompose your space in this direct sum. Here is the unstable part and here is the stable part. And uh, here you have uh, these estimates for the unstable part and these estimates for the stable part. For the unstable part, you have the lower estimate that you need. And uh, here is for the stable part. 
But uh, I told that it's not always you can ensure these properties satisfy, but of course, there are a lot of examples that you can prove that these conditions are satisfied, including in our specific case of this model, we can prove that this condition is also satisfied. But uh, in any neutral, it's not possible to ensure that. So that's why uh, there are some difficulties in order to deal with neutral equations. So also we have uh, the other assumption about the same flow. So we ensure that it's the same flow here. And uh, here uh, we have this other property that's uh, about, uh, we define it, this R, that's the difference between the solution, the same flow, and uh, here the part of the same group. And uh, we know that uh, uh, we asked about, by this hypothesis, that there exists T1, such that for every epsilon there exists delta, for all x in this ball, we have this estimate. Only to tell that here we are proving everything for the abstract context, but uh, uh, we will also then translate it for the concrete uh, problem, that's our specific problem. But here, if you see, we are working like with this general Banach space, but of course, in our case, this E will be our C, in the uh, E2 will be our C1 and so on. So we will have uh, our specific case, but here we are proving that for a general one. So that's why we are asking this condition, but for our specific case, we have this condition satisfied. Also, we, we have that this other condition is satisfied if we have that G satisfies all that conditions. And also we have this other is satisfied too. So we have that this rest is uh, satisfies this type of uh, condition in our concrete case. So in order to avoid to use a lot of letters here, like uh, here we have this K that appears here, in order to avoid that, we will use an equivalent norm that we denoted by this one here, and uh, we will write in order to avoid this K. So we will we we'll have this estimated without k. And uh, here we have uh, that this one will be the maximum of the unstable part and the stable part. So uh, for c in that interval, we define the con, and the con we have that uh, it's the element of e, and then, then you have that b is the, uh, the stable part and u is the unstable part. And also we have this estimate from the con. So the unstable part, the, the norm is big or equal to C, and this is the element of E. So using that, we can prove uh, the lemma that's uh, local con invariance and expansion. And we have that C is in this interval, and we take T1 bigger than zero as in hypothesis H3, which means that uh, we have, uh, that uh, we can satisfy like that. And then uh, if you take our Q like this, if you see by definition Q is bigger than one, and then there exists delta such that if you start in the con here, so we start in the con in X and in the ball, we have that T1 map will be in the con, so the con will be invariant, and also more than that, we have that the unstable part is ex expanding because this Q is bigger than one. So you are expanding the unstable part. So we have this, uh, this part here. So I will give a, a sketch of the proof. So here we take our uh, epsilon like that and delta as in the hypothesis A3. And then using the fact that we have this uh, about the norm of the projection equal one, we have that this one here, uh, if we use the definition of the solution that uh, the flow, uh, the definition of this R, that's exactly this flow minus uh, this part of the same group. So we have this can be here written like that. And then here only passing this, uh, this projection here, we have this. And now using that estimate that we saw before 
for the unstable part, we have that, and using also the uh, triangular inequality from the other side, and using the estimate for this R, we have this. And now, if we take, uh, we know that this X is in the cone, because that's our hypothesis, we are in the cone. So we have the estimate for the unstable part. We have, if we come back here, in the definition of the cone, we have the unstable part is bigger than equals C times this uh, part that the, the, all the solution, in our case, this X. So we have here, this is the unstable part of X, and then we have that bigger equal C, and here the, the norm of the, the X. So we have these estimates for this, this, this unstable part of the T1 map. And then here for the uh, stable part, the same way as before, we have that this one can be rewritten by this, and then we pass the projection, so we have that. Using again the estimates for the same group for this part, we have this. And using again that estimates for this R, we have that. So here we use that uh, this norm is smaller equal to the norm of the projection X, and we know about the norm of the projections one, so we have this estimate here. So um, by the definition of this norm, you have this one uh, is defined by the maximum of the stable part and the unstable part. But we know that the stable part is smaller or equal to this part here. And this is the unstable part. And then if this maximum is equal to this, so C is smaller or equal to 1, show us that this, um, if you start, we have this one that's the unstable part and uh, uh, we have that this since this is smaller or equal to this maximum and this is the maximum so we have that this is smaller or equal to this so we have this first one here and since c is smaller or equal to one we have this other estimate so we prove here that our uh, t1 map is in the cone because it's exactly what we need to be in the cone. So we have in that case that this maximum is equal to this, we have the invariance of the cone. So now we will consider in the other case when the maximum is this other part. So when we consider the maximum is the other part, we have this estimate from that uh, part of the maximum, which means this is smaller or equal to this. So we have that this is smaller than that. And then here we only sum and subtract in this term here, so that, that's why it's equal. And here, using the definition of epsilon, we have that. So we have this uh, estimate here. And then using the estimate that we have for this projection, so if you back here to recall, using that estimation for the projection, the unstable part, we have uh, this other inequality. So again, we have that this inequality is satisfied, which ensures that the T1 map is in the cone. So we again have that. So we proved uh, the invariance of the cone, but now we need to show that uh, uh, the cone is expanding uh, our solution. So we need to show that. So here we have uh, this projection in the unstable part. So here we have this estimate like that and uh, here uh, again we use the fact that x is in the cone so we have the estimate for the cone uh, related with the unstable part using c that's why it appears like that and then again using the definition of the epsilon that we take we have this estimate here and multiplied by this and doing some calculations we have this part here multiplied by this, and this is exactly our Q. So we have this expansion here of the cone. So we have that our cone is invariant for T1 map, and we also have this, uh, uh, this expanding of the unstable part. So uh, as I talked before, we made this uh, for the abstract framework, but we can translate all of these for our concrete framework. So if you translate, you will see 
that all that condition that we put before, as I mentioned, we have that they are satisfied. So this condition, uh, if G satisfies that set of hypotheses, we can prove that this one is satisfied. Also, this one also we can prove that it's satisfied. And this one, in our specific case that we're dealing with model, we can also show that we can decompose like that. So we have that all the conditions are satisfied and then we can translate this uh, local, uh, local invariance of the cone and expansion, we can translate it to our concrete framework. So using that, uh, uh, that, that result, we can prove our result for the, the linearized instability. But in order to do that, uh, we need to construct this set, that's the M3, and that this M3 is given by this X to G star that we defined before, that's invariant, intersection with C3, and using that hypothesis that we can have a, a, a continuous extension of this second derivative, we can prove that this M3 is a submanifold of C3. So just to recall you, the, this set X to G star, I will back because it's in the beginning. So, because it will be important here. So we have that, that is X G to, to star and this is invariant and it was a closed subset of this uh, manifold. So here we had the manifold that we defined before but it was not invariant. So we defined this set that's now invariant, but again, it's not a manifold, so it's invariant. So it starts here, you continue here, and now we define this um, emetry that is a submanifold. So that's given by exactly by this. So Using that, we have the following. So we'd like to prove that is unstable. And in order to prove that is unstable, the solution, we would like to show that if we start in some ball and that the solution always escape from that ball. And in order to do that, we start in, a, in this manifold and also intersection of the cone and intersection of the ball. And uh, we applied the T1 map of our solution. And when we apply our, our T1 map, what we know is that since the cone is invariant, as we saw before, for the local invariance of the cone, we know that our solution uh, are still in the cone, the T1 map is still in the cone. And uh, M3, by the definition, it's like this intersection. So our, sol our solution is in, in this set. This set is invariant. So the T1 map is still in the cone, is still in X to G star, and we have two options. It could be in the ball or it could escape it from the ball. If it escapes from the ball, we finish it. But if, it's, if it, it does not escape from the ball, we need to apply another T1 map. And again, we will have that it will be in the cone, it will be again in X to G star, and it could be or not in the ball. But look that in some moment, it should escape from the ball because we know that since we are in the cone, the cone expands the unstable part. So we are always expanding, expanding, expanding. So if you, we assume that we are always in the ball, uh, we have a contradiction. So we can prove that's the main idea of this uh, linearized instability. So here is the condition that we need. and. Uh, that's our linearized instability principle. That uh, is exactly that. So we can prove that your, uh, our T1 map or TN map in some moments will escape from our ball. So that's uh, the result that uh, we proved for this neutral equation. And it was the first part that I would like to, to talk, uh, this result. And the main difficulty that, as I told before, is about the spectrum of neutral because the behavior is not so uh, easy to deal with. We first tried to prove a general linearized instability principle, but we have these types of problems and that's why we needed to, to, to ask that type of condition and then we proved the result for our model that we are studying in this part. 
So the second part of my talk, I would like uh, to do some comments, it's more comments, about one type of equations that are measure neutral uh, functional differential equations. And um, this type of equations, they are very general equations. So uh, they look uh, like that, it's a little different. Only to, to mention, because uh, since I could not uh, uh, right, because I have this technical problem, but uh, now it's written here because probably uh, most of you look for this and think about like partial uh, derivative here, but it's not partial derivative. This means that is a function of theta, and this is that yt of theta is exactly yt plus theta, and theta is in that interval. Here is a compact interval, but does not need to be a compact interval. You could have like unbounded delay. There is no problem to have unbounded delay when you deal with these types of equations, like uh, equations with delay. But we only need to be careful about the phase space that we, you consider when you deal with unbounded delay because it's a little more complicated. And then here, uh, in that case, we are assuming that our initial condition, here's the initial condition, and again, it changes a lot from like uh, ODEs because here you have a function as your initial condition. So that's Y of zero, you are applying a theta and it's equal a phi applying theta. So you have that uh, equality here for the initial condition. You have a function in your initial condition. So uh, here we are dealing with a regulated uh, set functions, but they could deal with, I don't know, continuous functions and so on. And uh, uh, we have, uh, since that's a linear operator, we can, we can apply here his representation theorem and represent this operator like that. And then we can integrate it. And integrating that part, we have that. And using this representation of this operator, we have this part in blue. And then we have this integral form. And only uh, like put in order, we have exactly this. And uh, I would like only to do some comments, uh, uh, to make some comments about this type of equation. It looks like very complicated, but uh, um, they are very general equations. Because if, it, for instance, you have not this part, that's the neutral part, if you have like, I don't know, at zero, you have the functional differential equations that we were working uh, before. In that case, you have G of S equal S, so you have the functional differential equation. But also, since you have these type of equation, like it's Tilde's integral equation, we can also put impulses here. So is that possible to relate this type of equations with impulsive equation, also difference equations, so discrete equation. So we can put all of these equations inside of this. So we can make a lot of, uh, of uh, prove a lot of results for these equations and pass all these results to other types of equations. So they are very general. And uh, also only to finish, I would like to talk about open developing problems. So there are a lot of open developing problems in the area. So we have, uh, for instance, this one uh, to study deeper about these type of equations. Also here, the delay is a simple delay, but you also can consider like state dependent delays, time dependent delay. When your delay here, this theta depends on time or depend on the state. So we also can consider all this generality about measure neutral functional differential equations. And also you can work with like partial differential equations considering delay terms. So also you can uh, study a lot of uh, phenomena putting the delay terms in your equation and uh, see how it will work or how it will behave. So there are a lot of work to do. So. Uh, if you're interested about uh, these types of equations, we can also uh, talk about this, but we can also employ these delays in other types of equations. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. Maybe we have time for questions or comments from the audience. Uh, anyone who wants to ask, uh, please unmute and ask whatever you want. Okay, the, if there is no question, I have one. I have one question and my, my question is, the delay could be random. You can add a random variable there or some randomness in the delay. Mm, I never saw like that actually, but uh, it could be maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see something like that, yeah, maybe. Sorry, Julio, I have a question. Sure. The serving top uh, Santiago. Hi, Aguilin. Hi. The, the question is very simple, maybe maybe a little bit uh, basic, but can you explain the the behavior of the your first example of your talk? Why in the, the logistic equation the delay creates this uh, kind of uh, periodic phenomena? Can you give a ah, explanation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, usually uh, when you, you have this uh, with delay, um, I don't know exactly I think how uh, why that causes that uh, phenomena, that uh, oscillation, but usually uh, what happens is exactly because when you have the, I don't know, for, for instance, if you take a very simple uh, delay equation like uh, if you take for x dot equal alpha x of t, for example, for the OD, you have that this one it will be the solution. It will be exactly the exponential function. But when you deal with delay, this type of equation will be like, you have like cosine and sine. So that's why you have these types of uh, uh, periodicity that appears in such a behavior. So if you see that the logistic equation, it works something like that also to solve that type of equation. Uh, okay, is it something similar to what happens when you plug a kind of Caputo derivative or something like that? No? Mm, the, yeah. In that case, you are also looking at the past. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah, 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 exactly. Because also when you solve the the delay equation usually when you try to solve that you need to solve by steps so exactly that you look to the past and then you employ that past in some part of the interval and then you solve that and then you solve again so you do like the method of steps so i think it's it's because of that okay thank you okay any any more questions or comments if, if not, we thank Jacqueline again. It was a great talk, and we take uh, five minutes for the Ireneo's talk. So we have a five-minute break. So thank you very much. Thank you.